is La Neta, I am Ben Waddell, and today we're going to be talking about segmented assimilation. Now, again, La Neta, or the truth in English, is about digging into the facts and trying to understand how our social world works with the simplest facts possible. All right? So, I know you've heard about assimilation, but segmented assimilation is a little bit different. Now, assimilation is something that's oftentimes in the news, we hear politicians talking about it. So let's go to Donald Trump to get a little bit better understanding about how assimilation is being thrown around today. Finally, to promote integration, assimilation, and national unity, future immigrants will be required to learn English and to pass a civics exam prior to admission. All right, so this idea of assimilation, the idea of assimilating to another culture, has traditionally had to do with this idea of dropping the old and taking on the new. Dropping your old language, your old culture, your old traditions, and adopting the new traditions, cultures, and languages of the place that you happen to be residing in. In the United States, that has always meant adopting English and getting rid of Spanish or Chinese or Italian or whatever language it was that you or your, um, that your grandparents or, or the folks that, that came from another land spoke before um, you were here, right? So that's assimilation. So assimilation has always existed in the United States. We've always had conversations about immigrants and their ability to assimilate into society. But assimilation has never been the same for everyone, right? Assimilation depends a lot on whether or not you speak English, whether or not you have light skin or dark skin, whether or not you have the right immigration status. Are you documented or are you undocumented? Whether or not you have access to education or healthcare or meaningful work. All of these things influence whether or not you assimilate upward or downward, right, into American society. Now, the folks that have thought about this the most, Alejandro Portes and Ruben Rumbar from Princeton University, have highlighted a number of factors that deeply influence one's ability to assimilate into society. So let's look at a few of those. The t at the top of the list is race, right? So the color of your skin, it turns out, deeply influences whether or not you are able to assimilate positively or negatively into U.S. society. If you have darker skin, typically your assimilation process is much less positive. Right? Your experience is much less positive than someone with lighter skin. Now, another factor that's important is immigration status. You don't get to choose your immigration status. There are some people, people that have family members already in the United States or people that have access to money that are able to come into the United States with documentation. In fact, if you have a million dollars and you're willing to invest it in the United States, you can have a path to citizenship. But if you don't have that money and you can't invest into a business in the United States, it depends on the luck of the draw. So a lot of people end up in the United States without documentation. In fact, the majority of people that come to the United States come on tourist visas and then overstay those visas. They don't go home. Right? but then they end up living in the United States without documentation. So immigration status matters. Now the next thing on the list is this idea of bifurcated labor markets or split labor markets in which you have a group of workers with documentation that work in this upper group, right? So you have legal documentation, you're able to work with documentation and pay taxes and, and work with the IRS every year, etc., cetera, um, on your taxes. But then there's this underclass of workers, and this, this group has always existed in the United States. A group of workers without documentation who are exploited, who are underpaid, who oftentimes pay taxes. In fact, most undocumented immigrants in the United States are paying taxes. They simply don't receive a refund at the end of the year. Um, so the government actually, it, it's a net benefit for the government to have undocumented labor um, within the United States. But what it also does is it creates this bifurcation of the labor market, in which an underclass of workers um, exist and, and that trade is passed on unfortunately oftentimes to children right and so bifurcated labor markets have generational effects now the next thing on this list is language language matters a great deal an important thing to remember a take-home message right um, this is one of those moments in La Neta where you really want to hold on to this fact but an important message is that everybody learns English after the second generation so oftentimes in the first generation 65-70% of people speak um, English. But by the second and third generation, everybody is speaking English. So it is a myth that people don't learn English when they migrate to the United States. 
Um, obviously, if you're closer to your home country, a place like Mexico or maybe Nicaragua or Guatemala, you might be more likely to hold on to your home language longer than someone that's from India or Bangladesh. But everybody learns English by the third generation. Right? Okay, so the, the last thing on the list, education. If you have access to a good school, if you have access to a bilingual school that speaks both your native language as well as um, the host language, English in this case, right, you are much more likely to have a positive assimilation process or experience than somebody who doesn't have access to meaningful education. Okay, So these are factors that deeply influence segmented assimilation, but I want to hammer this home by telling you a story. I want you to remember how segmented assimilation works and why it's an important concept. All right, so this is the story of a young man named Martin. Martin and I met in graduate school at the University of New Mexico, and we were in a Latino politics class. And I still remember the day because Martin was in a suit and he had a motorcycle. So he would always come to class with his suit and his motorcycle helmet. He'd take off the helmet, he'd settle down, he'd sit, and he was always the best dressed person in the room. So that day we happened to have a conversation in class about this idea of segmented assimilation. The idea of whether or not some people assimilated easier to American society than others. Martin's mom and dad were from Latin America, um, from El Salvador and, and Mexico, um, respectively. And prior to jumping into college, he was about 25 at the time, but prior to jumping into college, he'd worked in D.C. as a lobbyist. And when he was working in D.C., he would have a suit on every single day. And he'd show up to hotels where he'd meet with clients, etc. And he said, it never failed. Every single time he showed up to a hotel, somebody would turn to him and toss him their keys. Right? They would toss him their keys because they thought that he was the valet driver, right? That he was going to take their car and park it across town or in a basement or along the street outside the hotel, right? And Martin said, you know, one of the things that I noticed, at first I just thought, oh, this is like, you know, this is a D.C. thing. He said he started to notice it only happened to him and other minorities. Now, I remember when I was younger, my parents would drop me off at the mall. I'd be 12, 13, 14. They'd say, all right, you got an hour or two to do some shopping. Um, and I'd go school shopping, right? I'd get my clothes for the year. And I remember that people would follow me around. You know, they'd see a young teenager, um, I guess a punk kid, right? I had the, the face of a punk kid. And they'd follow me around. And, and they would, you know, make sure that I wasn't shoplifting or whatever. And when I turned 18 or 19, somewhere in there, it just stopped, right? People just stopped following me around in stores. That never happened to me again. It's never happened to me since. But for minorities, that's the type of experience that continues to happen throughout their life. And so when Martin was describing this experience in class, it began to make more sense to me the deeply different experience that people with darker skin in the United States have compared to people with lighter skin. And I want to hammer that home with you by looking at some really fascinating research done by Edward Teles. And so we're going to break to that and I'm going to show you a chart that I think will help you deeply understand just how impactful your phenotype and your skin color is on not only your assimilation process if you're an immigrant coming to the United States, but just your daily experience in the United States. If All right, you are so I want to make this really clear, right? This is La Neta and what we're looking at are simple facts. And a simple fact in American society is that the color of your skin deeply influences your daily experience in work, in education, in social interactions, and many, many other things, right? But to really hammer this point home, I want to turn to research that's been done at universities that documents this impact. And for this, we're going to turn to some research done by Edward Tejes and Edward Morgia who did research on the impact of skin tone or skin color and phenotype, right, the way in which we look on education outcomes in California. So the chart I'm about to zoom in on is a chart that demonstrates how skin tone deeply correlates with one's positive or negative experience in U.S. society, at least in terms of education. So let's turn to that for a second. So as you look at this, what you're going to see is that on the left-hand side, you have lighter skin tones. And what you'll see is the average, um, the average school completed, the number of years that people have been educated, goes up as your skin gets lighter in the United States. Now think about that for a second. Why would skin tone correlate with education outcomes? Here in this research, they're, they're controlling for everything, right? 
They're controlling for what types of neighborhoods you live in. They're controlling for what types of schools you go to. They're controlling for your parents and whether or not they speak English or whether or not they're educated. They're controlling for your social economic standing, right? Whether or not your parents have a decent job. And what they find is even in the best of conditions, even at the best schools with kids that grew up in the best neighborhoods and who had the best parents, darker skin correlates with lower GPAs. Now think about that for a second. That deeply, deeply helps us understand the experience of minorities in the United States. And this helps us understand the experience of minorities coming to the United States as well. So people with darker skin that come to the United States on average would be expected to have a harder time assimilating to American society than people with lighter skin. That's what this research shows us. That's La Neta. That's the take home. Right, so this is the last segment. This is the last segment of La Neta. This is La Neta. This is the truth. And I'm going to be breaking down some facts with poetry right now, right? So this is a poem that I wrote a few months back after watching The New Colossus, which is a wonderful play out by Tim Robbins. Um, it's a play that if you get a chance to watch at some point, I would highly recommend it. Um, but this is something that I, I was going through at the time. I was in contact with this young man who was uh, brought to this country at a very young age, when he was two years old and was being deported from the United States, or he had, he had been apprehended by ICE. And so this is, this is how the poem goes. A true foreigner. As I sat amidst the darkness, tears rushing down my face, I thought of you, Eric Gutierrez. I do not know you, but I know your story. For your story is within us all, and that's what had me so torn up. On the stage, just behind, behind the absence of light, stood 11 distraught faces, screaming out, in 11 unrecognizable languages. As you sat in the Plata County Jail, these women and men, actors upon a stage, brought your story to life. Earlier in the day, my wife attended your trial. She sat with your girlfriend who was afraid to go alone. She was afraid of ice, for she is a dreamer, a recipient of DACA, the daughter of a woman who fled. Like the actors on the stage, she fled poverty, persecution, and cartels. Their stories were powerful, Eric. I wish you could have heard them. But more importantly, I wish America would hear them. They were actors, but their stories had roots in our reality. They were the sons, daughters, and grandchildren of immigrants, of slaves, of indentured servants, of Americans. And you too, Eric, are American. Born in 1995, the day after Christmas, your mother brought you here to pursue a dream. A dream so many others have pursued before you. And yet your sin of being born in another country before you could talk is the reason that ICE was in the courtroom yesterday. And it is the reason you were sent back to jail last night. Today you are en route to Denver, where you will be placed in custody of ICE, a humble servant of Homeland Security, the big brother of our times. As they acted out the narratives of their ancestors, it was impossible not to see the similarities. Their per perpetrators were history's demons, Stalin, Hitler, Mussolini, and yours, Trump, the GOP, the DNC. Amidst the darkness of the stage, we watched with our complacent eyes, complicit in your fate and silent in your removal. We embrace history, elevating it as ours, but not yours, for you came too late. We are the complacent children of the wretched, of the huddled masses, of those who yearn to breathe free. As my wife and I stood to leave, I wondered what it would take to move our nation to action. How many more of our sons and daughters will be removed before our polite applause transforms into audible demands? When will we begin to vote with our voices? When will we begin to stand against those who are oppressed? When will enough be enough? When, Eric, will we begin to recognize that your struggle is inherently tied to that of our ancestors? Soon you may find yourself in Mexico, a country you do not remember, a country where you will be a true foreigner. All right, that's La Neta for this week. We're going to keep breaking down truth. We're going to be keep breaking down the facts every single week. I hope that you've enjoyed this section. I hope you enjoyed that last little bit of poetry. I hope you remember that assimilation has never been in this country the same for everyone. It's always depended on the skin color, the immigration status, the access to education or lack thereof. It's always been segmented. So this week's lesson was about segmented assimilation. I hope it sticks with you, and I hope you join us for another lesson next week.